Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Our selected scripture for this morning comes from the first chapter of Isaiah, verse 1 and then 10 through 20. The vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fatted animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations. I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feast and your appointed festivals I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer me prayers, I'm not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Listen to, uh, learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they, are, though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you're willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. This morning, uh, Terry and I were up in the um, choir room a little earlier, and we were looking at some hymns. And would you believe that one of the hymns we looked at was, What Can Wash Me Whiter Than Snow? Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. Thank you. So this week we are in the uh, second week of a four-part series on Our Words Matter. Our words matter to others, our words matter to ourselves, and our words matter to God. Last week, look, last week we looked at what we say, the stories we tell ourselves, the words we use for ourselves. This week we're looking at what we say to God. Next week will be what we say to others, and then the fourth week will be what God says to us. And then the fifth week, where will we be? Mm -hmm. Over at the Baptist Church, worshiping there. So mark your calendar and get your food ready for the potluck dinner afterwards. So as we uh, prepare for our sermon message today, I ask that you would please bow your head and join me in a prayer of preparation. Lord, we come to you seeking your words of encouragement and guidance. <laughs> Speak to us. Be in our lives. Let us sense you everywhere. Be with us as we examine the words we say when we speak to you. Unclutter our minds, soften our hearts, and open our ears so we might experience your presence in our lives in this moment. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So this is our first time to look at Isaiah, uh, I think in quite a while. So... Uh, Today, I'll tell you, we're going to have a little bit more time in looking at, at Isaiah, what was going on when it was written, and the context of the time. So, Isaiah is in the Old Testament, and it's in what would be referred to as the third section <coughs> of the Old Testament, also called the Ketuvim, or the Writings. The book right before Isaiah, if you look in your Bible, is called uh, the Song of Solomon also called uh, the Canticle of Canticles, or the Song of Songs. And then the book immediately after Isaiah is the book of Jeremiah, which is one of the major prophets of the Bible. Jeremiah's prophecies are among some of the darkest and most pessimistic of, of all biblical literature. 
and were written to rebuke the Jewish people who had turned to idolatry and depravity. So Isaiah sits right between these two books and announces God's judgment of purification for Israel as a preparation for the coming messianic king in the new Jerusalem. The author of Isaiah, and else is indicated in what Betty read, is, is, is Isaiah, and he is the son of Az, Ap, uh, Amaz. Isaiah is often considered one of the greatest prophets with his writing. His name means the Lord saves. And he was a contemporary of Amaz, Hosea, and Micah. He began his ministry about 740 years before Christ came. Completed a majority of this work around 700. And then he died in 681. So he had a, a he lived to about age 70. Isaiah wrote during a very stormy period of the land of Israel. This map kind of shows the region at the time. And there's a little confusion because sometimes the word Israel could be used to, des to describe the, the part of the world that we refer to Israel now. But actually, at this time, it was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom of Judah. And you'll see them circled there. And then you can also see that the other areas that are uh, really pressing in on the small countries, the small region. Those, it was a time of war. The superpowers of the time were Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon. It was also a time of expansion of the Assyrian Empire and the decline of Israel. The Assyrians swept westward into what is now Syria, at the time it was called Aram, and to the land of Canaan. The kings of Aram and Israel tried to pressure the king of Judah to join forces, to form a coalition, but he declined. Matter of fact, this decision is condemned in the book of Isaiah. So Assyria did not assist Judah and it conquered the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 and 721. This made Judah even more vulnerable. And in 701, the king of Assyria threatened Jerusalem itself. The godly king, Hezekiah, prayed earnestly, and Isaiah pre predicted that God would force the Assyrians to withdraw from the city. <coughs> As we look at our specific verses for today, Isaiah 1 serves as an introduction and an identification of the author. It says that the text is based on a vision seen by Isaiah. And visions from the Lord were very common in the Old Testament as a way of God relaying messages to the people. Then we move to verse 10, which is meant to grab our attention Grab the attention of the reader. I mean, listen to it. It says, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. I mean, we've heard of the reference, Sodom and Gomorrah. What comes to mind when you hear it is pretty much the same thing that would have come to the mind of the people at the time. You know, God is striving to get the attention of the leaders and the people of Judah by using the name of two cities associated with sin and judgment. As we go into verse 11 and 12, it gets even more specific as to why God is upset. It says, the multitude of your sacrifices. What are they to me? I have more than enough burn offerings of rain. Of the fat of fat, fat animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you? You are trampling my courts. So here we have listed the very acts of worship that the Israelites were taught earlier in the Old Testament. How do we worship you, God? How do we show honor? And they were taught, bring burnt offerings. Do these things. And here God is going to him saying, 
All this stuff I taught you is noise. You offend me. <clears throat> These very acts. I mean, imagine if I came in here as the pastor in this congregational form of worship and said, the Lord has given me a vision and this worship time is an abomination to God. That would have been similar to what was going on with Judah to hear this from Isaiah. God was angry for them giving lip service and not having that earnest relationship with God. In verse 13, boy, this is pretty straightforward. God says, stop. Stop bringing me meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations. I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. You see, God's getting to the intent. You and I do not know the intent, intent of one another. Our best guess is to watch someone's actions. However, God knows our intent, knows our heart, knows our mind. So God can tell the difference between these people doing these sacrifices and worshiping the way they were taught and can tell that their intent is not there. They're just going through the motions. You know, you could ask, God, what happened? And God goes on to explain this in verse 14. Your new moon feast and your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. Wow, that's pretty strong. They have become a burden to me, and I'm weary of bearing them. So I thought of how can we understand the context here, and I thought of a surprise party that someone's throwing for your birthday. Has anyone ever arrived at a surprise party thrown for them? Well, imagine that you arrive at the surprise party, and it's for your birthday, and it's not your birthday. But it's a big celebration. There are people coming from all around Georgia. Someone has rented the entire building of the Hilton so that all the guests could come like pilgrimages, preparing themselves to come and worship, I mean, celebrate in the city for your birthday and it's not even your birthday and then when you arrive as you interact and walk around with the people they're like hi how are you and they move on they don't even ask you about your well-being they don't engage with you they don't even say happy birthday they're here for the festival the party the celebration and the intent of the reason why they're there is lost this is what it was kind of like for God to be looking at the people gathering together for festival, sharing in these forms of worship, and without the intent, without the relationship. Verse 15 would, um, would have been very relevant in the culture of their time. This is where God <laughs> says, When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I'm not listening. Your hands are full of blood. You see, at the time, the posture of prayer for their culture was not this. Or on their knees. Or bending down. Their prayer posture was like this. So if you're able and want to, stand up. And I want you to assume the prayer posture. Hold your hands up. Look to the heavens. This is what it would have been like for them to pray to God. I mean, look up there and think. God's looking back and is unsatisfied with your posture. You can put your hands down and sit down. Thank you. So here you're trying to show honor, but God sees in your heart and can see you're paying lip service. So not even your physical form of worship is acceptable in my eyes. As we go into verse 17, how are the people of Judah to respond? Verse 16 and 17 spells it out. It says, wash and make yourselves clean. 
Take your evil deeds out of my so sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. In the culture of Judah, ritual baths were common. When I stayed and lived in the Bethlehem region for a summer, I went with a Jewish rabbi who showed me this old Roman road that was leading into Jerusalem. And there was this mile marker that you could look at, and that was an indicator from the Roman times of how far they were to Jerusalem. And we went just a little bit further down the road, and there were ritual baths that were kind of overgrown, but you could see where there was a step to go down into the bath, and then over, and then up. So the pilgrimage people on their way to Jerusalem for one of the festivals would have stopped there, and this would have been one of their last places to become clean before entering the city. This isn't too different from many Christian environments of today. Did anyone notice the baptismal fount that I set outside on the right with a bowl of holy water? In many Christian circles, it's common to dip your finger in the water and to cross yourself as a remembrance that you have been cleansed through baptism. It's an opportunity to remember your baptism or to perhaps cleanse yourself before you come in. This is what God is asking of them. God is telling them to stop their evil deeds. Stop what they're doing when they know that it's wrong. Learn what is right. Then go out and do it. For example, we are to defend those who are oppressed. Probably one of the biggest examples in our current context that is facing our society, our culture, our country, and not just our country, it's really kind of global, is the idea of immigration and how we respond. How do we balance the protection of one's borders with the caring for those in need? You know, God is not really concerned with our policy and our politics. That's not what he's addressing or she is addressing here. Our beliefs and our politics is not the issue. We can practice what politics we want. We have the freedom to advocate for what we think our country needs to be doing regarding <coughs> issues. But what God is asking us to do is don't miss an opportunity to care for someone. And as I said before, we live in a both and world. Someone can believe that we need a stronger border and care for the needy. On one spot, I can advocate that this shouldn't be happening. And on the other, go, but it is, so I will contribute to the food for the needy. Well, how about orphans? It was mentioned, the fatherless. One of the programs we have coming up that we're planning is an event where we will help people understand the opportunity for either fostering or adopting. We're going to partner over with the folks at Arches and have an open community event where we can introduce people to our own well root. It used well root services. It used to be the Methodist Children's Home. They renamed themselves, so we'll have a speaker from there. And we'll have someone from adoption to help bring them to light that there is still that need. We are to take up the cause of the fatherless and plead the case of the widow. Care for widows and orphans was a major concern in the Jewish culture because everything was tied to the husband as the head of household in the society. So if you did not have a father, or if you were not married, you were out of luck. You either stayed with your family, or you were out on your own if you became of age or was divorced or somehow lost your family connection. And God is telling us to take care of those who cannot take care of themselves. In verse 18, we get to the title of today's sermon. Let us settle this matter. The text actually says, Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. 
In this verse, God invites the people to come reason with him. God is a reasonable God. God is a God in conversation with us, in dialogue, engaged, vocal, not silent, present, not absent. God created humankind to be in relationship with God. And God is all-powerful and can do what God desires, yet here in the text, we have an opportunity to see where God is reasonable and invites us into dialogue. Thus, what we say to God matters. Even though we are full of sin, thus the reference to the scarlet red and how we are cleansed through our relationship with the Lord. And the scarlet becomes as white as snow or like wool. In the last two verses, 19 and 20, the nature of God's reasoning relationship with humans is explained. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. <coughs> Here God, here God is offering Judah and us a choice that we can find relief from the empty religious ritual and find cleansing from our sin. But they and we must surrender our hearts before God. We all need to be willing to be obedient to God. Have you ever wondered why we are here on earth? Why God created humans? Or how about asking, what does God want from us? Our text today goes a long way in addressing this relationship with God. Our relationship with God also greatly influ influences our relationships we have with others and the way we see ourselves. Therefore, we're using the text today to address what we say when we go to God. What does God want to hear from us? Well, we might gain some insight by looking at our own human situation. What do we want to hear from others that we are in relationship with? Parent, child, friend, family, close neighbor. What do we want to hear from the people in our lives? I would think for God, God wants to hear everything and anything. I mean, we are made in God's image. Maybe we can glean some insight from our personal relationship with others and how it might affect our divine relationship. Yes, I see that God and humans may be similar, but God is so much more, and God can handle so much more than we can. So here I would suggest a variety of topics for what we say to God for the benefit of our godly relationship as well as our own relationship, our own welfare. Remember, last week we talked about what we say to ourselves matters and how our prayers and how our self-talk affect ourselves. And I'm thinking God might want to hear a variety of messages from, from us. For example, God might want to hear Thanksgiving. First of all. First of all, that God has provided so much from us, from the intricate creation of the human body to all creation. And from all the gifts that we've received to the gift of forgiveness, grace, and love. How about praise? Because God has provided us so much, we can praise the name of God, showing honor, respect, and just awe. And then love. We can certainly tell God that we love God. Have you ever done that? Let's try it right now. Say after me, I love you, God. You ready? I love you, God. One more time. I love you, God. As I wrote this, I thought, I don't know that I've ever said that out loud. I might have inferred it, referenced it. God is love. But I don't know if I've ever said it out loud. But yet it created this kind of warm, loving feeling within me, almost like when a parent engulfs their arms around you and says, I love you. As I mentioned, we could say anything and everything to God. So in addition to these things, there might be some other things that God's willing and open to hear from us. 
How about our pain and suffering? Like that parent holding a child when they're hurt. God enfolds us with God's love when we are in pain and when we suffer. Fears are another thing that we can share with God. Psychologists tell us that when we share and give lip service or verbalize our prayers, I mean our fears, it's the first step to addressing them and solving the issues. I think it's pretty biblical as well that we can cry out to the Lord what our fears are and receive care and comfort. And here's one of my favorite ones is anger. Is it okay to be angry in front of God? Is it okay to be angry with God? So part of my own journey in dealing with anger has been to verbally speak to God. God, I'm angry. I'm angry with you. Why did this happen? And God is strong enough to handle it. Of course, it doesn't stop there. There's ongoing conversation where I kind of work through that anger and Half the time I realize, okay, I'm really not mad at you. I'm mad at myself. Probably more than half the time. And then finally, how about confession? You know, health, <coughs> confession is a healthy conversation. It's fairly good to share with God and maybe even somebody else. That's how come bartenders get such great tips. They sit and listen to somebody's confession across from them as they talk. But this is a serious form of confession where we come before God and share what we identify as our own sins and shortfalls. We open the gateway for feeling forgiveness and experiencing growth. You've heard it said that Christ died for our sins and therefore we are forgiven. Yet sometimes we may have a challenge feeling that connected with, with forgiveness and confession can be a way to open that path to feeling that God loves you and has forgiven you. Remember, God can take it all. In Ephesians 3.20, God actually addresses this. And the scripture I'm going to read is from uh, The Message by Eugene Peterson, which is a vernacular translation. God can do anything, you know, for far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He doesn't do it by pushing us around, but does it by working within us, <coughs> his spirit deeply and gently within us. Well, when do we talk to God? Well, one of the ways we do it is through prayer. Have you ever heard the idea of pray without ceasing? I see that almost like on a spectrum. One of it is the mum one end is the mumbling and grumbling to ourselves. It's a form of prayer and talking to God and ourselves. All the way to the other end of the spectrum where you find formal prayers that you might read or recite or even say the Lord's Prayer. Songs in worship are often a form of talking to God and when we talk to God. Even songs outside of worship. And I assert that any song with the intent of connecting you with the Holy Spirit is an acceptable form of worshiping and singing. Reading scriptures, of course, is when we encounter God, whether we read it alone or with others. And then even in discussion, I'm not talking about gossip, did you hear? As much as when we share with each other some of our issues or concerns, when we listen wholeheartedly, and love one another through discussion. And one of my favorites is the still quiet moments when I get a chance to be quiet and listen to what God is trying to impart to me. What we say, when we say it, how we say it matters. But what matters most to God is that we say it. God wants to be in relationship, yearns to be in relationship, much like the story of the prodigal son that can be found in Luke 15. The son asks for his inheritance, receives it, leaves home, goes out into the world and squanders it, finds himself at such a low level. He decides, even if I went home, I could eat with the animals in my father's, at 
my father's home. So he returns home to grovel at his father and to eat with the animals. But what happens instead? In the distance, while he's still coming, the father sees the son, runs out to embrace him, calls the people around and go, get a robe, put a ring on his finger, recognize him as my son, for he has returned. Kill the fatted calf, let us celebrate. That's not what the son expected. That's not what you and I expect. But that is God's, that's similar to God's response when we reach out when we respond or when we turn from sin, we receive that kind of reception and even more. Maybe we need to spend some time this week talking with God and watching what we say to God, reflecting on what we say, how we say it, when we say it, where we say it. But most of all, I think God just wants us to say something. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you'd like to join our community, you have a couple of options. You can come up here in the last song, which is a traditional Methodist way of accepting someone. Or, if you'd like, you can visit with me in the foyer, and we can talk afterwards. With that, let's sing, sing our closing hymn, Everlasting God. Mm -hmm.